Welcome to episode 34 of the 411, folks. My name is Scott, and I am back, ready to talk games. Now, the reason why I'm saying I am back, and not we are back, is because I'm all alone today. Jake's not here, Kian's not here, I'm going solo. Um, and because I'm going solo, I've chosen a topic to discuss on the show, which Jake and Kian really won't have any solid input on. They don't really uh, play any games from this developer. So the, the topic that I'm talking about is uh, the developer Big Ant Studios, which is an Australian company. Um, and they're known for games like Rugby League Live and Dom Brabham Cricket. If you're a listener of the show, you'd probably, you've probably heard me talk quite a lot about those two games, but I'm always shut down quite quickly by, by uh, Jake because, you know, he's not really a, a fan of the game. Um, so we rarely talk about sport games at all on this show. Um, sometimes we bring up FIFA or NBA just when they're in some news uh, headlines. But um, other than that, there's yeah not really much uh, talk in sport games. So this is my chance to really, um, you know, let it all out. Um, it's a show that I've been wanting to do for a while. Actually, before I actually started this podcast, um, Jake was doing his own podcast with another friend called The Grind. Uh, and I considered starting up my own thing, just going solo, um, just to talk about uh, games like Rugby League Live and, and Don Brab and Cricket. Because basically, I reckon about 50% of my gaming time would be spent on games like those. So that was sort of a project that I wanted to get started by myself. But um, Jake, you know, we, we got together and... Um, Started the four one one folks, so I didn't really have to. So, this is a, a long time coming. This episode, um, but before we get into the actual topic of Big Ant Studios, I just want to uh, start our show with what I've been playing. Um, so, what I've been playing this week is Don Bradman Cricket. Um, I've been really trying to get back into Xenoblade Chronicles. Uh, I said on the last episode, on episode thirty three, that I really want to. Uh, play all those 3DS games like Fire Emblem Fates and Bravely Second uh, before Christmas because I know in, at Christmas time I'm getting games like Pokemon Sun and, and Dragon Quest Seven, so I need to finish some of those games before I get those uh, before I get those massive RPGs. But no, Don Bram and Cricket 17 is out in stores in three days, so I'm really preparing um, myself for that game. I'm really excited. It's cricket season now. Cricket's on TV. It's all I'm watching, um, and so yeah, I, I really can't help myself. Just whenever I'm just sitting around, I just really want to just play some cricket. So really looking forward to Don Brabham Cricket 17 in three days. I'm definitely going to be picking that up, and it comes out on the first day of the th- the fourth test. For Australia, so it's Australia and uh, Pakistan playing on Thursday. It's their first test, but uh, fourth test overall for the summer. So, I really wanted to add more structure to this show. Um, over the over the course of this entire show, we've really lost a lot of structure. Jake and I, we started off having uh, our certain topics that we were talking about, our certain segments of the show, and we've really lost that. And that's basically due to us not having enough time to actually prepare for shows anymore. Um, but now that I'm on holidays from work, I'm on a bit of a break. I have sat down and I've written a, up a bit of a show and I really want to try and stick to this um, segment and show. So, yeah, the first segment I'm hoping will always be what we've been playing and it's probably going to be a little more detailed than that one was, but just because it was Don Bradman Cricket, that's all. But the next segment is usually some news that... Uh, some interesting news that happened over the week that we talk about, Jake and I. Um, but instead of calling it news, we're, I'm, I'm going to try something else. I'm going to call it things that have caught my eye. And um, I've written down seven things that have caught my eye this week. And maybe a, from a couple of weeks before as well. So there's some a few old things that I, I had no idea about that I've just written in here because I just found out about. Um, and that's, again, just from going back into uh, searching through the internet. Um, but I haven't done that in a while. So, yeah, searching through things and all these news stories, I found out a lot of things that I didn't know that happened a couple of weeks ago. So you'll be hearing some of those. Um, so the first thing that caught my eye... Um, 
was that was there was a new character added to the Friday the Thirteenth game, um, and there was a trailer for this character, and I got to say the game is looking good. This Friday the Thirteenth game started out as just sort of an, a little online game. It was sort of not a full, fully fleshed game. It was just an, a little online game that you could play with your friends. But this game is looking amazing. The graphics look first class. Um, and the the trailer that I saw was with a car- character called Tommy Jarvis, and I, I'm not really sure on who that character is. I'm not really a huge fan of the Friday the Thirteenth movies. I just thought that this was a really good um, idea for a game. Now, Tommy Jarvis, apparently you can do sort of, uh, what's it called, taunts in the game. So if you press a button, he'll say something. And his taunt was uh, something like Maggot Head or something. So he was calling out names, um, which is really cool. If all the different characters have their own taunt, if you press a certain button, they'll say something out loud. Um, the, the gameplay that I saw from Tommy Jarvis, is this is the new trailer that it showed off, was... Oh, just a really eerie feeling. He's walking through the forest. Something has obviously happened because he's he's a bit apprehensive. He's he's got his flashlight out, um, and he and he's calling out these taunts. So he he he's aware that someone's out there. Um, and what I didn't know was that now that this game has a single player campaign, so I was sort of wondering why I haven't seen much of this game lately. And I thought it was due out to be this was going to be due this year, but. No, that's not the case. It's actually delayed till 2017 because there's a single-player campaign. That's what they're working on now. Um, the original goal in the Kickstarter was for $700,000, and they actually got $800,000. So I guess they can now afford to add a few extra things in there, like a single-player campaign. I, don't, I, I really don't expect it to be a massive single-player campaign. I reckon it's just going to be a bit, maybe three hours max. Um, just a little a little story that you can play by yourself. And that's really all they need because, you know, fans for this game were really only expecting just a multiplayer game. But now we can get our, um, our own single-player game. And this might lead into other things. If this game really sells well, they could do a Friday the 13th 2 with a more fully fleshed-out campaign. And like I said, the game already looks incredible. Um, they've already got the, the, the right atmosphere for the game, the proper music and everything. It looks really scary, so it looks awesome. Um, okay, second thing that have, that has caught my eye is Walking Dead Season 3, A New Frontier. Now, this is a new Telltale game that's coming out very soon, and I had no idea about this either. Um, so people have probably, you know, you, you're probably sitting there going, oh, I knew about this for weeks. But I, this just came out of nowhere for me. It sort of got hidden, hidden away in these news stories that I was scrolling through. Um, and I really didn't expect that a new Telltale game was coming out so soon. I mean, they have Batman. They just announced Guardians of the Galaxy, which is what we talked about last episode as well. And... It's quite ironic because last episode I was actually saying I'm really hoping they release something on, along the lines of Game of Thrones or Walking Dead again, um, and because it's something that I'm actually interested in because I'm not really interested in Batman or Guardians of the Galaxy. So uh, yeah, so this is really exciting because I've just caught up um, with Walking Dead. I've just finished season six. I know season seven is out now and um, they're halfway through it now, but I wait until it comes out on Blu-ray and then I buy the Blu-rays. Um, if I watch it on TV weekly, weekly, um, it's just, that doesn't work for me. I need to marathon an entire season. So, um, and you don't have to turn the podcast off right now because I'm not going to give you any spoilers if you haven't seen it. But um, I know with Game of Thrones Telltale series, which is the only one I've actually completed for the Telltale, um, that sort of is based on the show. You have to have watched up to a certain season to play that game and fully understand what's going on. And I'm pretty sure that was maybe season three. It's just around the time when the game came out. Um, so with this one, Walking Dead season three, uh, the new game, I don't know whether you need to have seen season seven for this or just to the end of season six. So I really want to find that out because I'm not going to be able to see Walking Dead season seven for quite a while until it comes out on Blu-ray, which is probably in about six or seven months. Um, so I've got to wait quite a while for that. Um, but in the meantime, I can play Walking Dead Season 1 and Season 2 because I haven't played them before. So I can do all that. Um, yeah, but really good news because, you know, I loved the Game of Thrones series. I played the very beginning of Walking Dead Season 1 um, and just tried to get into it a little. I wasn't really into it, um, but I, I, I will 
but that that was sort of my first introduction to uh, a Telltale game. I really didn't know the mechanics or what was going on. Um, but after fully playing Game of Thrones, I understand what Telltale's trying to do now, and um, maybe I can really get back into that. So yeah, really looking forward to Walking Dead Season 3, A New Frontier, um, and that's coming soon. Um, as well as that, there's also the Michonne series, uh, The Walking Dead Michonne. So y- now there's four whole games that you can get for Walking Dead, which is really awesome. The third thing that caught my eye was Resident Evil 7, a new demo that got released. Now, I haven't really been paying attention to what's been going on with Resident Evil 7 since it was first uh, announced at E3, and uh, my god was I impressed. Jake and I, that was both our game of the show for E3 2016, um, and it's one of our most anticipated games for 2017. Now, this, this new demo um, is the same gameplay, but it's just added new features to the gameplay. So, you're still in that same house, and it still comes up um, that you have to escape from the house, or I can't remember what it exactly says. I think it says, just get out of the house, which I love. It's such a simple mission. It just says, it just tells you what to do, and that's what you have to do, um, which, you know, at the beginning, I found it a bit unrealistic when it tells you to get out of the house yet you sp- you can spend an hour searching through the house which is which is a little strange like it's a bit unrealistic my first reaction if i woke up in a place like that was yeah get out of the house if there's a window jump out the window you need to get out of there you know so just like the friday the 13th game this game has just got the right atmosphere it's scary it's it's simple you know you don't need too much you don't need to do too much to scare people um i think when games come out, they try to do too much. They try to put too much in there. Lots of jump scares, lots of enemies. You don't need that. You just need atmosphere to scare people. It's more scary thinking that something is around you than knowing that something is there. So I think that's what this game does incredibly well. Um, And, I mean, this is only the first hour of the game and people have been replaying and replaying this over and over again and they're still into it. So... Yeah, really excited for the end product, uh, Resident Evil 7, and I'm pretty sure that comes out in January, so I'll be getting that uh, very shortly. The fourth thing that caught my eye was the NES Classic. Now, this uh, is a topic that we dedicated ourselves to, and I think in episode 32, um, this, this NES Classic has really been a problem for Nintendo. There's been a major shortage uh, people just can't get their hands on it, and uh, I'm pretty sure a lot of people just have been wanting to pick it up for Christmas. So when it first came out, EB Games, their their website just crashed um, because of the sheer amount of people just going online, trying to pre-order, trying to buy it. Um, so then within, I don't know how long it was, maybe it was a day, maybe it was a few hours, but NES Classic was just sold out. It was sold out in Australia, it was sold out in America, it was sold out everywhere. You couldn't get your hands on it. Um, NES Classic was just put back on shelves by Target. And what happened to Target? Their website crashed as well. So, same thing happened. So, that just means people are still after it. I don't understand why they didn't just release so many more of these. Miyamoto actually... Shigamuro Miyamoto, it's a difficult name to say... uh, he actually recently did an interview and he spoke about the NES Classic and he said that the demand for the NES Classic was greater than anticipated. So Nintendo didn't realise how big of a thing this was going to be, uh, which I find quite surprising because usually they're all over that. Usually they understand. But again, like Jake and I said before, this could be just a ploy. This could be one of their little plans just like maybe the amiibo was, which is not you know not a not a confirmed thing, but this is what everybody's thinking that um, to make things rare is to you know make things more seem more uh, valuable. So people want it more because they know that it's it's really hard to get. So this could be something like that, but um, this is just all good news to me that the NES Classic is. They, they realise the NES Classic is so important to people because all it is is nostalgia. And if they realise that nostalgia is important to people, especially to us here at the 411 folks, then this might, uh, this might provoke them to bring out the Super NES Classic 
or, and this is what I've been waiting for, the Nintendo 64 Classic. I've said before that if that thing comes out, I can die a happy man. I've just been waiting for something like that to come out. Um, you, you can buy a Nintendo 64 from a retro gaming store, but I, I really just want something like the NES Classic where it just comes all bundled in one, all the greatest games just in one. It's very easy. And it's really small as well that you can just put up somewhere on your shelf. Um, so, yeah. Good news from Nintendo then. Um, number five. The fifth thing that caught my eye was a fan project from a uh, place called... TES Renewal, uh, they're making something called Sky Oblivion, which is to put the map of Oblivion inside Skyrim. And uh, they've actually made significant progress over the, the past year. They've come out with a trailer showing what they've done all year. Um, and really, it's just, the trailer just shows scenery shots of um, areas from Oblivion, um, and the game's l looking great. I had no idea about this ex uh, existing either, so this is just something that's new to me. Um, this is a mod that they're making. It's a fan project, so they are putting the map, and I'm pretty sure from what I've read, I, didn't, I, I sort of skimmed through it, but I'm pretty sure from what I read that they're putting all the map and objectives and everything to do with Oblivion inside Skyrim, so you can play the entire of Oblivion in uh, the game Skyrim. So, the Xbox One and PS4 versions of Skyrim were just released, the remastered versions, which allow mods. So, I'm kind of hoping that this mod comes over. I hope it's just not a PC thing, because this looks damn good. Uh, this is going to add just hours into the game. And I've always thought that Oblivion has looked better than Skyrim, not in terms of sheer graphics. I just thought the area of Cyrodiil in, in Oblivion looks a lot better. I just love the greenery rather than Skyrim's sort of dark, snowy areas. I've never really been a fan of um, the dark places. It's not... It's You know, you're going to be staring at this place for a long time, for, you know, over 100 hours, so you want it to look good. And I've always thought Cyrodiil looked really good. So I came into Oblivion quite late, though. The very first Elder Scrolls game I played was Morrowind, but I'm not going to count that because I just really... I was young and I was, I was young and dumb. I had no idea what I was doing with the game. Um, so the, I, I guess the first Elder Scrolls game that I played and got into was Skyrim. Um, and then I guess going into Oblivion straight after playing Skyrim, I got into it a bit late. The mechanics weren't there. You know, when you were walking through the map, you had to sort of load sections. Uh, yeah, I got into it. You had to play Oblivion before you played Skyrim to really pr appreciate what that game what that game is. So to have an, a remastered version of Oblivion would be awesome. The sixth thing that caught my eye was quite a big thing, actually. Super Nintendo World is a new theme park from Universal Studios, and it is opening in Japan just in time for the 2020 Olympic Games. It's quite, quite. Uh, it's kind of a shame that you have to travel to Japan to see this. Um, you know, even if it was open to in America, I guess you'd have to travel there as well. Japan is closer for me than than America is, so I guess um, I'm quite lucky in that regard. Um, I have a, fr a couple of friends who have actually been to Disneyland in Japan um, and in America, and they were telling me that this just it is just packed, and I'm pretty sure that this Super Nintendo World is going to be no different. So, you know, that's the that's the only downside to a place like this, is that the sheer amount of people they let in, um, you'll spend all, you'll spend most of your day standing in lines for things. I think you'll probably see maybe three or four events during the entire day. So you'll, yeah, that's my problem with theme parks. You just spend your entire day standing in lines. But this is, you know, a revolutionary thing. People have been asking for a Nintendo theme park for a very long time and it's finally happening. So I've written down a few things that I thought would be really cool that they added and I'm, I I, I kind of hope they, they do this. So they've definitely got to have a Mario Kart of some sort. Even if it's just like a go-kart thing that you're going around, I mean, that's what, it, that's what it should be, that you're racing around the track in sort of a Mario Kart style. Maybe you can have actual courses from um, the game. So if you have, uh, you know, Luigi's Raceway, or, I, don't, I don't really know the names of courses, but if you have a simple course, you know, with no big jumps or anything crazy like that, just a really simple course, but it's actually 
made exactly what it is from the game. And maybe it's got the same music playing in the speakers when you're driving around. I thought that would be really cool. Um, the only thing to question is the items. Um, if you can get items when you're racing around. But I think that would be a little weird. Maybe maybe there are just some banana peels randomly placed on the road. road I don't know. Um, another cool thing I thought was um, an actual... An actual ride where, you know, you sit, you get buckled in and everything and it's all controlled is the Donkey Kong Kart ride. So Mario Kart ride is something that you control, you're controlling the go-karts. The Donkey Kong Kart is something that is a controlled ride where it is going really fast and then it jumps up by itself or, you know, landing on these other, other platforms. That would be really cool. It would be a really scary ride as well, actually, because the, the Donkey Kong Kart is... That's pretty full on. It's quite difficult. Um, so... The last thing that I thought of, which would be really cool, is you can play your own Mario course. So maybe take an exact Mario level from the game, maybe even the very first Super Mario level, and and actually build that from scratch. And it would be awesome if you could stand in a line and, and then take turns in actually doing that course yourself. So you're walking, you're jumping over the Goombas, you've got to jump up those sort of rocky hills and then jump on the flag to end the course and go into the castle and then you leave. So I thought that would be really cool, especially um, for kids. If it was built for, for kids, I guess, at a kid's size and then they could sort of climb the things and be jumping up. I don't know what would be the Goombas. Um, maybe just their little... I don't know, remote dolls or something that you can jump over. But I suppose a lot of kids will be jumping on them. So <laughs> that wouldn't be good. But this is all good for Nintendo. It'll, it'll invite a lot of children in. Um, it'll reinvigorate these kids to know what Nintendo is. Um, and I hope it comes out a little bit before 2020, just so it does well for the Switch. I, I'm sure that the Switch is going to benefit from this park. Um, so like I said, children... There'll be so many, so many children go to theme parks and uh, having a Nintendo-based theme park is just going to do so so good for Nintendo. The last thing that caught my eye, number seven, is Goodbye Box Boy. Uh, this is a new game that was announced. Um, it's a sequel to, uh, what's it called, Box Box Boy? Um, and the first game was just Box Boy. So... I'm pretty sure this would be the last in the franchise because it says goodbye, Box Boy. Um, and the cool thing about this one is it actually also comes with an amiibo. And the amiibo, the amiibo looks really cool. This is uh, I don't have... I have one amiibo. I have Captain Falcon. That is it. Um, but this Box Boy amiibo looks actually really cool and I'm considering getting it. I really enjoy the Box Boy game. I've, I've, I've played the original for quite a bit. I haven't got the second one yet, so I've been meaning to get that. Um, and if I enjoy the second one, I'm I'm probably definitely going to be picking up the third one. It took a while for the second one to get released over here in Australia. So, um, it's probably going to be the same for the third one. I'll probably be, probably be waiting a while for it. I have no idea what the Amiibo would do though. Maybe you can use it in other games, which would be cool. Um, but really... Box Boy has become a, a, a sort of its own franchise. It's a really popular character now. I'm hoping to see Box Boy in the next Super Smash Bros. Uh, I really think he deserves a spot in that. All right. Um, those are the seven things that have caught my eye for the week. Now, I am going to take a little bit of a break myself. It's actually quite, quite difficult to be talking uh, this long without some water or anything like that. Usually, when I'm drinking the water... Jake covers for me. I can I can look him deep in the eye when I'm drinking the water, going, "Don't you fucking stop talking. You keep covering," uh, and that's what he that's what he does. So I don't have anyone to do that for me now. So I'm gonna take a little break, have a drink, and I'll be back. Okay, let's get back into it. So the topic that I've decided to to choose to talk about is Big Ant Studios. Um, Big Ant Studios is an Australian developing company who develops games 
like Rugby League Live and Dom Brabham Cricket, but they, they don't. that's not the only two games they do. I would say that they those two are their main franchises. A few other games that they've done are AFL Live, Tabletop Cricket, Casey Powell Across 16, Big Brash, Big Bash Cricket 2016, which is a mobile game, uh, and recently just another one called Masquerade The Bobbles of Doom, which is sort of an action-adventure game. The publisher that they use is True Blue Entertainment. Now, True Blue Entertainment is also used by Wicked Witch Software, who I would say are their rival sporting company. Uh, Wicked Witch Software does the Rugby Challenge games and now the AFL Live games. So, Big Ant Studios were the ones who started AFL Live. Wicked Witch Software took over and did AFL Live too. So, I would say that they're the rival companies because they do release Australian sporting games just like uh, Big Ant Studios does. AFL Live 2 had poor reviews. Um, I've got a couple brothers who are really into AFL and uh, they got the game that it was sort of unplayable for them. They, they couldn't touch it. I suppose they're a bit used to the um, EA Sports titles like FIFA. But uh, yeah, I mean, so am I. I'm used to them as well. But really, when I, I'm i a huge fan of rugby league and cricket, but I can still play those two games. So really, the game isn't as good as it should be. So uh, in saying that, Rugby Challenge 3 looks great from Wicked Witch Software. I've been really meaning to pick that up um, for a while now, so that's something on my list to get. Now, Sidhi is also a developing company that used True Blue Entertainment, but they haven't released a game in a long time. They did the original Rugby League games. They did Rugby League, Rugby League 2, and Rugby League 3. Um, and then I suppose that Big Ant Studios took the licensing from them and did Rugby League Live, Rugby League Live 2, and Rugby League Live 3. So, the interesting thing here is Sidhi uh, Interactive released Rugby League 3, their last game. At the same time, Big Ant Studios released Rugby League Live, their first Rugby League game. This happened in the same year in 2010. So, what a great year to be a Rugby League fan. Too bad that I wasn't a Rugby League fan back then. I started watching the game in 2012, so I missed out on that whole thing. Uh, the, the only game that I played of Sidhi's was, um, I say Sidhi, I'm not really sure how to pronounce it, it's S-I-D-H-E, so I'm, I'm just going to say Sidhi. So the only game that I did play from Sidhi was the original Rugby League, and that was on the original Xbox. Um, from what I remember, it was a great game. Um, I didn't pick up Rugby League 2, and I didn't play Rugby League 3, which is a Wii exclusive, um, but... Now I really want to go back and look at Rugby League 3 and compare it to Rugby League Live because they both came out in the same year, um, which is something I only found out um, a couple of days ago when I was researching for this show. So I do want to go back and have a look at the differences there. They'd probably have the same lineups um, in their teams, same squads and everything, so same jerseys. So that would be uh, good to compare. That's sort of like having the FIFA and the, the PES games coming out at the same time. So, you, do, you don't really get that. You wouldn't get that anymore, I, I don't think. So, and I don't know how would that would work because Sidhi maybe mustn't have had the licensing. Only one company could have had the licensing. So, I'm not sure how it works there. So, like I said, uh, Big Ant Studios is not only known for their two main franchises, Rugby League Live and Don Bradman Cricket. They've got other games, but here's where I question that because... I'm not sure why they have some of these other games. I'm not sure why they're spending time on developing these things like tabletop cricket. Now, I watched gameplay from this tabletop cricket game, and it's a very small game. It mightn't have taken them a long time to, to do, but they are a very small company. And really, I think they should be focusing all their efforts and all their resources onto their main franchises to really, uh, to really do well with them. Now, tabletop cricket, really, that's a board game. Um, that you play in your living room, and the gameplay that I saw is that you are in your living room, and you're playing the board game in your living room, um, and the sort of the, the board game characters are these little plastic characters, but they actually do have some animations and some movements. Um, it looks pretty fun, but I just don't know why they would spend time making that game when they, they already have the most successful cricket franchise in their hands, Don Bradman Cricket. So, it just confuses me why would they that they should spend some resources doing that. 
Um, they have a game called Big Bash Cricket 2016, which was just released. Now, I get that because that's a mobile game. So, they're releasing that exclusively on another console. So, it's just for mobile. So, I do get that because that that um, brings in a, a whole lot of new players who don't own consoles. They, they just want to play on the go. Um, and it's a really good idea because uh, the Big Bash Cricket, you know, Big Bash is a very popular thing. And instead of doing the 20 overs, which I was watching gameplay and I was like, they're not really going to be batting the 20 overs, are they? They, they actually batted for 5 overs each, which is something you can do on uh, Don Bradman Cricket as well. When you play online, the, the default setting is just 5 overs, and it's a really, really good um, amount of time to be bowling and batting for. It's a really nice, quick game, and you get actually a, a realistic score. So I was watching gameplay of this Big Bash Cricket and... Uh, and the guy batting was just smashing them for sixes. Um, he got he got one out, but he kept you know hitting them as hard as he could. And I think the final score is about one for a hundred and thirty something. So that's actually a realistic twenty twenty score. So um, yeah, they've done really well with this. I think it's a multiplayer thing as well. So one bats, one bowls, um, and then you swap over. And it's just a really nice quick game. So I get that one. I don't get the tabletop cricket one. I also don't get the Casey Powell lacrosse 16. Um, this might be a big thing for the lacrosse fans out there, so forgive me, guys, but I really don't get why you'd spend some resources and time and money just on doing a lacrosse game. Um, it's an American game as well, which I found out, so I watched some gameplay. I really hadn't seen any gameplay at all, um, and the commentary was American. The teams were American, so this is an Australian company doing an American game. I can kind of see where they're coming from if they're trying to get into the US market and make their make a name for themselves over there. But I, yeah, I just don't see it. I mean, and and from looking at it, they it looks like they really didn't put a lot of time and effort into the game just because it it's a complete copy and paste from Rugby League Live 3. The menus are identical. The the sounds are, are identical. The uh, the grass and the, the fields look identical, except, you know, obviously different lines and different um, uh, rules and everything in the game, so different control mechanics. But the the players look, you know, like the, the player models are all identical and everything, so it really looks like they didn't put a lot of time into it. Um, I, I just don't I just don't know what the, the point of this game is. Is lacrosse really that popular? I'm not, I'm not sure. I just don't hear really people talking about lacrosse. So, yeah, maybe it's not for me to comment on. Um, Masquerade, the Baubles of Doom is a game that came out this year as well. It's sort of like an action-adventure game. And I was reading the list of games that they had come out with and I was thinking about this one. And I'm thinking, why? Why release this game when you really want to be known as um, an Australian sporting company um, that releases these really, really good games that you can't really get anywhere else. You can't get a, a rugby league game anywhere else. You can't get a, a cricket game anywhere else anymore. Um, so people rely on this company to do as best as they can, but then they spend time on doing this game. I did look at gameplay of um, this one, and actually, it, it looks good. Um, it, re it really reminds me of those Shrek games back in the day in, on, on the Xbox. Um, the jumping sort of looks the same, and the, and the fighting and everything looks the same. So it looks really sort of cartoony and quirky. It looks good, but I just, yeah, I just don't understand why they would spend time on doing this. So this topic is about the rise of Big Ant Studios, how it started from nothing and how it's gotten so big. Um, so we're going to go through a list of all the pros and cons from their pretty much three biggest games so far. So Rugby League Live 2 will be first. Um, and now I've spent hours with Rugby League Live 2, so I know a lot about the game. I've come up with a list of pros and cons, so I'm going to start with the cons. First thing on my list is interceptions. Um, in this game, there are uh, ridiculous interceptions. Okay, if you're going to pass the ball, if the player, if uh, one of the opposition players are close by, you know he's just going to intercept it. You can predict an interception when you pass the ball. That's how bad it is. Um, and the, the worst thing about it is as soon as one of the opposition players intercept the ball, you cannot catch them. They will run off with the ball and they will score a try. It's almost a guaranteed try. Okay, uh, next one. Kicking uh, the high ball in, into the goal for you to score a try. Um, so this is where one of your playmakers will kick a really high ball a high ball up in the air and you need to catch it in the goal to score a try. 
this is pretty much... It shouldn't be in the game because of how broken it is. When you kick the high ball, or when the opposition kicks the high ball, when you're trying to catch it, the way I figured it out how to do is just don't press anything. And just change your player so you're nowhere near where the ball is going gonna, is gonna to land. Let the AI do that. Because usually when you let the AI do it, they just will fumble and nothing will happen. So you'll, it'll be kind of like a restart. If you try and catch the ball, you will, you will pretty much 95% of the time miss. Okay, so that's somewhere it's broken in the game. Um, so that's really annoying. Um, player speed is another one. If you make a line break with a forward, so if your player maybe is you know over 100 kilos and you make a line break, you could probably score a try even if one of the fast players are trying to catch you. So, um, yeah, player speed really needs to be adjusted there. Commentary in the game is abysmal. You've got Phil Gould and um, Michael Voss, who... Uh, you don't even commentate together anyway. Michael Voss is a Fox Sports commentator and Phil Gould is a Channel 9 commentator. So I'm not really sure why they were put together. So basically when you're playing this game, if you make a mistake, Phil Gould will shut you down all the time. Um, he gets really annoying. So basically I can't play the game with sound anymore. I've had to mute the game um, and put something else on. Um, the same can be said about the crowd noise. The crowd noise is just this constant airy sound and it gets really annoying um there's no it creates no atmosphere so if you make a line break the crowd's going to make the same amount of noise as it does when you're just sort of you know playing playing the ball normally so um they've got no real sense of atmosphere there player trades in the game um are actually quite good i i, I enjoy the player trades but the the gripe that i have with it is it only happens at the end of the year now that's not that's not realistic in rugby league. Player trades can happen all through the season. You hear stories about players signing with other clubs um, throughout the whole season, so it doesn't just happen at the end of the year. And also, when you make a big player signing or you lose a big player, um, they don't necessarily tell you where they go. Um, sometimes at the ends it'll t- tell you your ins and outs, but it sometimes will leave some of the big players out, so you're not sure where your players end up. I remember I um, I bought Sam Thiday once for my Melbourne, Melbourne Storm team. And I had him for one season and let him go. Um, and they didn't, at the end, they didn't say which club he ended up in. And then I had to go sort of search for him myself to see what team he ended up in. So it really sort of doesn't uh, give you much information there. Field goals. If you're um, sitting on a draw and you really want to win the game with a couple seconds left, Field goals are kind of impossible unless you're really close to the to the goalpost. You need to be within maybe uh, uh, probably 20 meters to the field goal max. Otherwise, uh, the, you know, the, just the the boot's not that strong when you when you uh, hold down the button to kick it. So usually, um, sometimes when you see field goals taken, they sometimes 30, 40 meters out. You probably won't won't get away with that in this game. Um. Okay, so one of the biggest problems I have with this is the difficulty levels when I play this game. So, I am stuck on, I think it's Rookie, there's Amateur, which is the lowest, then there's Rookie, and then there's Pro, and then you you know got your Legend and, you know, whatever's up there. So, I can sometimes play on the middle one, which is Pro, um, but... Due to the interceptions, I can't. I have to play on a lower difficulty. So I'm stuck on a lower difficulty because of the amount of interceptions and tries they score. If I play any higher, I'm still left with those interceptions and all those tries that shouldn't shouldn't have been given um, and also a harder difficulty. So I'm constantly losing games on those higher difficulties due to interceptions. Uh... One of the pros on my list is the 2013 DLC update, but something that I wrote in the cons about that 2013 update was that the other leagues in the in the um, game don't get updated as well. So you can be playing your NRL team with the 2013 kits, um, and everyone's aged a bit, but everybody else in the junior leagues, in the uh, English Super League... None of them have changed. They're still in their 2012 squads. So when you're doing trading and everything, you're trading 
2012 squads into your 2013 team. So there's kind of a, um, a problem there. Uh, also, when you are trading, if you're taking teams, if you're taking players from the junior leagues, so the NYC, um, the players will not get replaced in their team. So there's no sort of um, randomized players that get generated into the team. You are just left with an empty team if you keep taking players from that team. Also, those players don't age as well. So if you're taking players from that team, uh, if you're maybe five or six seasons into your career, um, and if you're if you want to take a player from maybe the young Broncos squad, that player will still be the same age as he was at the start of the game. So he'll still be you know 18. So it's sort of uh, a bit out there. Uh, adding players into the league. This game has a lot of customization, but if you want to sort of make this game your own, it's kind of hard to do. So you don't have the option to maybe, if I wanted to say Andrew Johns has come out of retirement and he's coming back for a season, I can't add him into the league unless I make my own custom league, which won't me, which won't let me sort of access all tradings and everything. It's really only just for a season you can do that with. So it's kind of frustrating um, that you don't have the option to do that. Um, also, player ratings, I have a bit of a problem with. Some players are rated, rated way too high. Um, and I think that is to do with the amount of players in the game. So you've got all your junior leagues, your English Super League players, um, uh, your sort of domestic clubs and everything as well. So there's so many players in the game that they've rated all the NRL players just so high. They're all basically in the 90s and late 80s which is kind of unrealistic because you've got a lot of players in the NRL which aren't that good. They shouldn't be in the 90s. I'm, I'm hoping for a more FIFA approach so you still have players in the NRL that are rated low 70s, um, high 60s, that kind of thing because, um, yeah, there are players who just really aren't that good but there's just no nobody else out there that can fill their spots. Last gripe I have with Rugby League Live 2 um, there aren't really that many because I really enjoy Rugby League Live 2. I do find it better than Rugby League Live 3. The last one I have is that I did find Carmichael Hunt when I was trading. He was kind of a free agent. Um, he wasn't part of any team. I can't really remember how I found him, so I did buy him from my club. And ever since then, this was a couple of years ago, ever since then I've never been able to find him again. So I know that Carl Mar- Michael Hunt is in the game. Um... But I don't know where he is, which makes me wonder how many other players are actually in the game that I that I have never seen before. So um, yeah, there's not really a search thing where you can search for players like that. All right, rugby league live two pros. Now I haven't written a lot down here, but. There's more cons than pros, but I actually do really like the game. There were there were times when I got really over the game just because of these annoying cons, um, especially interceptions, but overall the game is really fantastic. So player likeness in Rugby League Live 2 is really good. Every single time you see a player, I know who it is just by looking at their face. It's it's really They've got a really good customizing tool that um, allows you to really make a player however you want. Um, again, customization is really good, so you can create whatever player you want, you can create a team, um, you can create sort of your own league if you want, um, but you just sort of can't add that into the the main game, you just sort of have to make your own competition. Uh, goal kicking is really good actually, um, it's quite realistic, the goal kicking, um, with the wind meter and everything, so I really enjoy goal kicking. Stats, there's a lot of stats in this game, um licensed leagues so there are so many leagues in this game you can play the English Super League um, you can play with the junior clubs you can play with the I forgot what it's called sort of the Queensland Cup and the New South Wales Cup all those teams so there's a lot of uh, competitions you can play uh, one of the pros yes 2013 DLC so um, the, the there was a good update there um, one of the biggest players that were updated into that 2013 DLC was Sonny Bill Williams, so you can um, have him in your squad. Um, and just the last thing that I wrote down was it was realistic gameplay for its time. So if you do, if you don't know what this game is and you look it up on YouTube and you see the gameplay, you're gonna think, "What the hell am I talking about? It's this is not realistic at all." 
it's because you're comparing it to games like FIFA, okay? This game does not look like FIFA. Um, it's never going to look like FIFA. But that's okay. Because it's a rugby league game. And if you really love the sport, you're going to really like the game. Okay? No matter what it looks like. As long as there's good gameplay, it shouldn't matter what the game looks like. Um, and that's where I come into Rugby League Live 3 which does look a lot better. It's a very good-looking game. Not quite to FIFA standards, but it is still a good-looking game. Um, but I honestly didn't enjoy it as much as Rugby League Live 2. It's not as realistic as Rugby League Live 2. It's actually quite hard to score in this game. I don't know if anybody else has faced this problem with the game, but I I find it really difficult to score, which makes, this, which makes the scoring very unrealistic and again I think that's has to do with uh, the problems in difficulty so the difficulty settings for Big Ant really need to be adjusted with these Rugby League Live games um, okay so the big addition for Rugby League Live 3 was the uh, career player mode so sort of towards, towards the back end of Rugby League Live 2 before Rugby League Live 3 was, 3 was coming out I was really keen to play with a career player, and I really wanted to play with a fullback. Um, and then this finally came out, but it really didn't live up to what I thought it was going to be. It, it, it gets quite boring, just hanging hanging around, for, waiting for the ball, and whenever the ball comes near, you have to call for it. Sometimes sometimes the ball moves so fast that you, you don't even know if you have the ball or not sometimes, and uh, you're sort of running along. Um, I've gotten a lot of offsides because I thought I had the ball when I, when I didn't, and then I called for it again. And then they threw it forward pass. So the AI really needs to be fixed up there. Um, but again, for the career player, there's just not enough stats. And I just don't understand. Stats in a game aren't that hard to put in. You don't have to do... I mean, I'm not a game designer, but you wouldn't have to do much to put stats in a game. They're just... It's just maths up there to look at. It just makes it a whole lot more interesting. Just have a career player history tab where you can click on and you can see a whole bunch of stats throughout your career. Because in the real world, when you're looking at a career, when you're looking at the career of a player, you're always looking at overall how many tries they've scored, how many games they've played over the course of their career, um, and which different clubs they've played in, how many origin games they've played, how many games they've played for Australia or New Zealand or whatever country they come from. So just adding something like that would make a huge difference. Um, I've written down player likeness for cons. Player likeness in this game is atrocious. I don't know who's who in this game. And really, that's that's a big flaw. When you come from Rugby League Live 2, where I knew what everybody looked like, and this game is supposed to be the sequel to that, and I have no idea who's who. So that was a huge flaw, and there's, there is the player hub in this game, which came from Dob Bradman Cricket, where you can make your own players, and people are making really identical players, where Big Ant Studios, I don't understand how they couldn't do that in the first place. They're the developers of this game, and they couldn't make the players look identical to the, to the real players, whereas just normal fans are making better players. So that's a bit embarrassing for them. Atmosphere in this game is another con. Um, again, no atmosphere. And the commentary is terrible as well. So the crowd noises um, are really poor. Now, I'm being really critical of this game because I had really high hopes for it. Um, so that's why there's a lot of there's a lot of cons on this list, which, are, which I'm really not happy with. Again, Rugby League Live 2, I, I've put in nearly 500 hours. I think Rugby League Live 3, I've played for about maybe 80 hours. So, I just haven't stuck to it. It just, it, to me, it's not it's not a very good game. There's dumb AI in career mode. You you really have to play with a really good team to actually win some games, because it is a team effort in rugby league. I was fullback, and I was losing every single game. Um, whenever I had the ball, I made really good breaks. 
um, scored a lot of tries, but really I just couldn't hold the team up myself. There's just really dumb AI and they do some stupid things. Um, and again, all the all the scores are really all the games are really low scoring, but just because there's a lot of times where you get close to the line and there's always a knock on or you lose the ball or something happens where you just have they have they try and take the ball back and it goes back and forth with no, no scoring. Um, and that's where I come into simming. So sometimes when you get taken off the field, the game sims. Or you can watch it, but you know, you'd ra- you'd rather sim it so you don't just have to sit back and watch so you can get out there and play again. Um, when you're simming, I'm pretty sure this is a little bug in the game. I don't know if it's been fixed by now because I haven't um, put it on for a while. But the scores just go out of control. So if I'm at maybe, let's say, 6 to 4, and I'm maybe... 30 minutes into the game and I get taken off the field and then I come back on after half time and the scores suddenly jump to 20 to 16 so in a space of you know 10 minutes they've scored a few tries they've scored sort of two or three tries each it's just this it's really ridiculous and also most of the time when when I sim the scores go to uneven numbers so somewhere in there that both teams have scored field goals, which is just ridiculous. No, nobody does that, especially in the first half. In the second half, they would only score a field goal unless they're, they're in a sort of a draw. But that's why the scores are really unrealistic. And I really, uh, I spent a few a few games there where I just had to really just watch rather than simming because I didn't want an unrealistic score. Um, so that needs to be sorted out. Try line tackles were really annoying. I thought they'd fix something up here. There are people just standing around when someone scores a try. When you in real life, they'd be all over the ground trying to stop the ball from touching that try line. Scoreboard. Um, I was really impressed with FIFA 15 when that came out and had the licensed scoreboard for this for the Premier League. No idea why they can't just license the scoreboard in rugby league. The game is already licensed with all the teams and all the sponsors and everything. Why can't they just have either a Fox Sports scoreboard? Or a Channel 9 scoreboard, just to make that game even more realistic. Don't know why. I mean, they've got a Fox Sports commentator and a Channel 9 commentator, so not sure why they couldn't do either one of those. Uh, news stories were an addition to this game, but really, there's there's quite, there's no point in having the news stories. That really doesn't give you any new information. Um, has got nothing on FIFA's news stories. This was a this was a big thing that they were gonna say they were gonna add in. Um, and I, I, this is another thing. It's just like the stats. I don't know how hard it is for them just to maybe type up a few hundred news stories to put into the game, where all it is is just telling you how much bank uh, money you've got in your bank account and and who you're playing this week. You know, it's not nothing really interesting. I've spoken about uh, the uh, the atmosphere in the crowd, the crowd graphics. I've got a gripe with abysmal again i mean how hard is it to um animate the crowd a little bit more outside stadium graphics so when you're looking outside the stadium it's very very pixelated um there's obviously been no time spent on that um it looks very first generation xbox um yeah i've spoken about the unrealistic scores so it's very buggy, I've written down. And also, again, player ratings is, the, is my last con for Rugby League Live 3. So player ratings weren't really fixed up um, from the first game. So with the Rugby League Live 2, you could only see the player ratings when you were trading. Rugby League Live 3, player ratings are always available for you. And to be honest, I, I kind of liked when they were hidden because they were so off. And in Rugby League Live 3, they're also off again. So I don't really like seeing them because there are some players you know a whole lot better than other players, where their but their ratings are higher. So, and that's all to depend on when this game was made as well. So this game did come out last year, um, and some of the players, like let's say for example Corey Oates, his rating is quite low, but that's because he was just starting out, and now after a year of him playing, he's been playing Origin now and, and everything. He's established himself as one of the best players of the game. Um, his his rating should be a, a lot higher, but um, again, it just stays where it is because of the lack of updates or anything. All right, Rugby League Live 3 Pros. I've sort of 
shat on it for quite a bit now. So let's just talk about some of the good stuff in this game. Graphics, I've said graphics are a lot better. The grass looks really good. Um, kicking in the game. So kicking in the Rugby League Life 2 was very poor. It was sort of, I tried to avoid kicking a lot. But in this game, it's really good. They've really got it down, um, really got it down this time. Um, it's really quite accurate if, where you want to place your kick as well. So playing as a playmaker is really fun. Sideline dive try is something that they added in. So if you're trying to score a try down the sideline, um, you no longer have to worry about being um, pushed out or jumping over by accident. So your player will jump in the air and uh, try and touch the football down on the sideline. So that's really cool. The driving tackle is really cool as well. A lot of the times in uh, Rugby League Live 2, I had problems with just being tackled on the spot and not making any ground. A lot of the times in Rugby League, when you get tackled, you're trying to push the players back so you can gain the extra couple of meters. And uh, the driving tackle allows you to do that in Rugby League 3. Be a pro mode in this game was awesome. I've spoken about that Um there's quite a lot of problems with it, but it's really cool to be able to take control of a player, um, a star player that's already established, or create your own. And of course, Player Hub introduced in Rugby League Live 3, which pretty much says that they're not going to bring updates to this game. It sort of relies on the fan um, fan hub to sort of generate their own updates, uh, which is kind of smart, I guess, in a way. So fans can just do it themselves, and it doesn't. And it allows them to t- begin to take quite a quite a long break between games. It doesn't put pressure on them to release annual games or biannually. Um, so, I guess fans can sort of update their teams as the years go by and wait for a new game. Um, the con list for Rugby League Live Three, all the stuff that I had gripes with. I guess that that's also a wish list for Rugby League Live Four. Um, Oh, one of the bigger things as well I've just skipped over. I had a really good idea. So, um, the two the two main things that I, I'd really like to see in Rugby League Live 4. The first thing is the stats for the career player. So, the, the history, how many games they've played all together. Um, so, that just gives you a whole lot more information. It really makes you more invested in your career player. Another thing as well, which is quite simple... Um, it's just sort of typing in information. This is for Big Ant Studios. Type in information is maybe when your career player is starting to get a bit more popular, maybe you can have an offer to go on the Footy Show or the Sturlo or Matty John Show or NRL 360, things like that. So to make guest appearances, um, to get your name out there, to get him more popular. And really, you don't have to show a clip of your player doing that because that's a lot of work. But why don't why don't you just say that your player is going on one of the one of these shows to make a guest appearance so i just thought that would be a good idea just maybe to get a bit more invested in the game all right so that's uh yeah that's rugby league live um so i had a lot of cons on that list um not many pros but all in all it is a really good series it is the only option if you want to play a rugby league game so i guess you you have to put up with those cons, but I really hope some of those cons are turned into in, into pros in the next instalment. Um, and I, you know, this is the rise of Big Ant Studios. They are getting better with with every single game they release. Let's get on to Don Bradman Cricket, um, and this is very exciting because Don Bradman Cricket seventeen. I'm just going to say DBC because I don't want to say Don Bradman Cricket all the time. So DBC seventeen is out very soon. Really excited for it. Um, I'm still playing Dom, uh, DBC 14. Um, I originally got this on the PS3. Um, graphics were quite horrible back then, but then they came out with the HD release on Xbox One and PS4. So I picked up the Xbox One version um, and actually it lo- looks really good um, on the Xbox One. So I'm going to go through the c- pros and cons of DBC 14 now. So cons. Um, there aren't as many as the Rugby League games because I really believe this is the the um, the best Big Ant game yet. And I really think, and I've said this on another po- podcast, D- DBC, Don Bradman Cricket, is, their, is Big Ant Studios' puppy. This is their game um, that they really want to do annually eventually. Um, they re- they've really spent a lot of time making this the perfect cricket game. So, 
commentary is horrible in DBC14. I played a couple of games of the commentary, then turned it off. I don't even know who the commentators are. Uh, never heard of them before. Not like the rugby league games. And oh, I just I don't understand how they how they accepted this. They're just I I, I can't even give an exa- any examples. It's just it's just cringeworthy. I had to mute that. I haven't listened to the commentary in a couple years actually. Um, so. I'm really hoping for a bit better um, in the next game, but I have seen some clips and I've, I'm hearing the same kind of commentary style in the in the next game, so that's pretty disappointing. Uh, crowd, the graphics in the crowd is pretty terrible, um, and also the crowd quantity is very unrealistic. If I'm just playing a uh, domestic cricket game, which is probably mostly what I've been playing, really trying to get into the Australian cricket team, um, domestic cricket rarely has a crowd. Um, my brother actually went to a domestic cricket game the other day in Melbourne, and there was about 10 people in the crowd. And that's a realistic crowd for one of those games. So to have an entire stadium packed out for one of these games, like Queensland versus New South Wales or Melbourne, I mean, sorry, Victoria versus Tasmania, that kind of thing, it's very unrealistic. And it kind of takes the whole uh, excitement out of the bigger games. So if I'm playing in front of really, really, really small crowds for my whole entire domestic career and then I finally get accepted into the Australian Test Cricket team and then I go to that and then there's a massive crowd, it's going to be really exciting. But now I've been playing in front of massive crowds for the entire time, so it's not going to be as exciting when I get into the bigger games. The atmosphere is really poor as well. I mean, crowd noise has always been a big problem with Big Ant Studios. I, I kind of hope that's fixed in DBC 17. I mean, I was watching a cricket game on TV the other day, um, played in India, and the atmosphere in India is just incredible. So they're sort of playing these big trumpet things nonstop, and um, yeah, I just I, I don't there's there's none of that in um, in DBC fourteen. Outside the stadium, the graphics are poor as well as the rugby league live ones. So they really need to maybe um, put some time and effort into making the outside of the stadium look really good. Batting lineup doesn't change. When you choose where you want to bat in your in your squad, you stay at that batting position for your entire career. It doesn't matter what club you go to in your career. If you get accepted into Australia or whatever, you will bat at that position or bowl. I'm just talking about batting because I always bat. So I picked at number two. Um, and I'm very close to getting accepted into the Australian team. This is my new career that I'm doing now at the moment. And I realized that I'm going to be taking David Warner's spot in the batting team. And there's no way in hell that I would realistically take David Warner's spot if I'm just starting out in the Australian cricket team. But that's what it does. It replaces that number two batting spot and he will never be seen again. So that's a really um, big flaw in the game. Um... So, I've written down pro player replaces whatever number you choose. Yep, we've talked about that. Scoreboards are very ugly to look at. It's just this black and white thing. It's just n- not nice at all. I mean, how hard is it to make a nice looking scoreboard? Not, you know... Again, things that I don't get. That th- They're the easy things that can be r- done right in this game that just aren't done right. Um, some There's some dumb fielding that takes place. Uh, especially over the boundary line, if the ball is rolling really close to the boundary line and you're running after it, um, you may jump over the boundary line to get the ball and that's an automatic fall. You've just pushed the ball over the over over the line. So it's really ridiculous. Also, when you're trying to catch the ball, you have to be standing still. So if you're running towards the ball and then you stop, then you can catch the ball. But if you're running towards the ball and you stop and the ball keeps going, you need to keep running and stop again to catch the ball. So, I've missed a lot of catches, or um, I've been saved quite a few times from dumb, dumb AI, when the ball's floating quite high and you're stopping, but then you realize you need to go a few more meters and you run again, but then you miss it. So, that needs to be fixed. And again, career player history. There's no sort of history for your career player to, to look back on. Um, and that's another thing that needs to be fixed. It's quite easy as well. All it is is just looking at some stats. The pros for Don Bradman Cricket 14. I've written down perfect batting. 
And I really believe that. They've really nailed it um, with this very first game. I, I remember when they said when this first game came out, they said they just wanted to get this game out and really nail the fundamentals of cricket. They didn't care what it looked like. They just wanted to have good gameplay so they can build on that for years to come. They originally wanted this game to be annually, but it's taken three years uh, for the next one to come out. So perfect batting. It's all about timing, and that's and that's really, you know, quite right. If you've ever batted before, it is all about timing. Um, it's all about where you place your bat. Um, so they've really done really well in this, and it's actually fun to bat in this. Really fun to bowl as well. Usually in cricket games, the bowling is the bit where you usually simulate. But this time, you can play an entire career for just bowling because it is fun. Um, leagues. There are so many leagues you can play with, especially it helps with the fan hub as well. And that's another pro on my list is the fan hub. Um, this is the very first big ant game that has implemented the fan hub into it. So you can create whatever team you want. You can create whatever player you want and put them into the game. Uh, and yeah, so leagues, you can play lots of different countries and all the different domestics. Um, so there's lots of different options there for you to play. So really just an awesome game. I've put into the PS3 version, I put into probably 100 hours. The Xbox One version, close to 200 hours. I've played a lot of Don Bradman Cricket. Um, so that's why I'm really pumped for the new one. Now, I've written down a list of pros and cons for DBC 17 as well, even though the game's not out yet, but I've seen quite a lot of gameplay on YouTube. Um, a lot of gameplay from channels like Twisty3 and, and Tyson Bennett and Insane, um, guys like those who dedicate the channels to games like these. Um, so shout out to them. So I've written down a lot of pros and just a couple of cons for DBC 17, which is a good sign. Let's go through the pros first. The graphics in DBC 17. There's been a major improvement in the graphics. It's looking really good. Um, the scoreboard is looking awesome. So it's not just the boring black and white now. Depending on what team you're playing for, that's the color of the scoreboard. So if you're playing for Australia, it's got that nice green. The New Zealand's got that really dark, dark, dark gray, um, almost black. Um, England's got that dark blue color, so it kind of looks like a real scoreboard that you'd see on TV. Um, yeah, it's the font is looking really good as well. So just all the little things um, that make this game good. That that's the little one percenters. Um, let's see what else I've written down. Fielding is a lot better now. They're trying to make so again, like I said, the big complaint with cricket games was that bowling was not fun. Don Bradman Cricket made bowling fun to do. In this game, I think they've made fielding fun. So they've made a little mechanic where if the ball is in the air or if a ball is coming really fast to you, it goes slow motion for you to catch that ball. And there's a sort of a little meter where you need to click right in the middle and you can catch that ball. So they've made fielding fun. Um, this time, the AI doesn't look like they're dumb asses. Okay, so they look like they know what they're doing this time. When they run for catches, they don't have to stop to catch the ball this time. This time, they can jump in the air and catch the ball. Big surprise. Um, also, when the ball is about to run over the boundary line, they don't jump over the boundary line and catch the ball and to throw it back this time. They actually tap the ball back in and you know risk themselves by jumping over the boundary line. So that's smart AI this time. Um, when looking around the field to see the players around you, um, when you're batting to see, you know, the fielders where they're standing in DBC 14, you could just see their positions. And this wasn't actually in the original game. You, um, this came as part of the update in the new one. You can see the positions, you can see the player names and you can see the player ratings. So their fielding ratings. So you can decide whether if you want to hit it high Maybe you hit it high to one of the fielders with a low rating. You can see who that is. So that's really that's a really good improvement. Because before, you had no idea who, who you were hitting it to. Um, a batsman can move beyond the crease now. So in DBC 14, you couldn't move very far beyond your crease. You couldn't move beyond your crease at all, actually. So this time, you can move, I think, as far as you want. Like From the looks of it, he was when I was watching the gameplay, he was really far along the line. Uh, fan hub this time. So, from what I saw, and I don't know if this is just the PC version, but I saw jerseys 
with their actual sponsors. So I saw the Commonwealth Bank logo on one of the jerseys. Um, I saw the ASICS logo on the pants. Um, I saw proper logos and sponsors for these teams. Um, and I really hope that's in the Xbox One version of the game. I really hope that players have implemented that into the, this place. So, yeah, really looking forward to that. Fixed. They've fixed the batting lineup. So, you don't always have to bat at number two if you choose that. You do get moved around um, according to your your fitness and how well you're playing. Women are in the game. You can play Women's League. Um, and I'm sure the fan hub will have all the, the right um, women's names and everything in the game. Um, you can play in your junior leagues now. So, when you start out, you're not just going to start out as a 16-year-old playing for Queensland Bulls. You will have to play uh, part of the junior leagues and try and get it, uh, into Queensland Bulls. So it's a lot more realistic career mode in that perspective. Although in saying that, it, it's a lot longer now. So before I thought it was a really long career mode just trying to get into Australia by playing all these cricket games. Now it's even longer. So, I mean, I guess if the game's good, it's not going to really matter. Stadium creator. creator. Um, you can make your own stadiums now, which is really good, especially for the junior leagues. They're not going to have any stadiums, I don't think, for the junior leagues. So if you wanted to make like a little park um, with no grandstands or anything, it's just a little park with people sort of standing around with your junior league team, you can do that. So I can make just the park across from me down the road if I wanted to. Uh, wind. Um, so it, it has a little windometer, if that's what you call it, um, for when you're bowling and batting to, to let you know. Um, so that's always, that always helps. Just giving you options like this. Um, you can manage your bowlers now by setting their rotation. So I think this comes with being the captain of the team. You can um, see what their stamina and their confidence is like um, and what kind of bowler they are, so their mentality. Um, giving you all these options again. And, and the last, the last uh, three notes that I've got for pros is just, again, giving you so many choices and options. The selection status difficulty. So it's got the playing difficulty, how hard the game is, but it's also got the selection status difficulty. So this t this um, tells you how hard it is to get accepted into teams like Queensland or uh, or Australia even. So you can get into there quite quickly if you wanted to. Um, you can play as the player or the whole team this time. So not just um, your career player, which is a bit stupid anyway because... Uh, <laughs> Then the game would literally take hours and hours and hours to finish. So really, I just like to play with my career player. The very last pro that I've got for DBC17 is that you can accept or decline offers from clubs. Before, you just had to choose which team you wanted to play for in the club and then go play for that th team. Whereas most of the time, I didn't even want to go play for those clubs. I just wanted to do my time in domestic, try and get into the Australian team. Um, so this time you can actually pick and choose what you want to do. So DBC 17 is giving you lots of options, and that's really good. That's all good things. Um, and, and that's it. DBC 17 will come out in three days, um, and that's Big Ant Studios' newest game. It's looking really good. It looks like the best one yet. And that's why this video is titled The Rise of Big Ant Studios, because they are on the rise. They are getting better and better with every single game they release, and they will just keep getting better. Um, and it's just, I'm really looking forward to anything else that they've got coming out. I know they're dedicated to do the Rugby League Live Series and the Dom Bradman Cricket Series. Um, Wicked Witch seems like they've taken on the AFL Series and the Rugby Union Series. Um, it looks like rugby... I mean, it looks like the AFL Series has a new game coming out called AFL Evolution, if you didn't hear about that. Um, there's no information yet. I think that was just sort of leaked um, from the Australian rating ESRB thing. Oh, and I'm finally done. And that was a lot of information to go through. Um, I hope it was sort of interesting, I guess. You know, if you haven't played these games, I hope it sort of I gave you some insight into them. Or if you have played these games, I hope you kind of agree with all the cons and pros um, that I had. Uh, but if you have any others that you'd like to mention, just um, leave a comment down below. Um so I'm going to finish the show with a NOS shuffle. And this is the first one I've done by myself. Usually it's nice to have someone opposite me uh, go back down memory lane and talk about an old game that we used to play. But unfortunately that's not the case today. So for those of you who don't know, 
Nos Shuffle is where I randomize a list I've made of 100 games. Uh, these, this, there's 100 games that Jake and I played as kids. Um, we shuffle that list and whatever game comes up, that's the game that we go back in memory lane and talk about all the things we used to do with that game. Um, so yeah, I'm going to shuffle the list now. And the game that has come up is Black. Uh, black. Black. So Black was uh, a, an original Xbox game. This is when I first got this game. This game was buggy for us. We could barely play this game because it kept freezing. I'm not sure if that was because our Xbox was really old or not. But uh, this game was sort of released towards the back end of when Xbox was kind of being phased out. I'm pretty sure it was a 2005 game. And uh, the Xbox 360, I'm not sure if it was released 2005 or 2006, but yeah, Black was really one of the back-end games, and it, I think it was quite ahead of its time. This was a shooter, first-person shooter, where whatever you shot at d got destroyed. It, it blew up, pretty much. So, that's, that's pretty much the selling point for this game. I mean, whenever I saw the trailer on TV, that's all it showed. Whenever you shot something, it was blowing up. Um, you could pretty much shoot anything you wanted. It would leave marks, and I think the marks stayed there as well. So, quite ahead of its time. But we had major problems. Whenever we put in the game, we could probably get through the first mission, and then, then it would crash on us. So, I'm pretty sure that was to do with our Xbox, because our Xbox started playing up towards the end. Um, or maybe it was just a problem with the disc. But I was a young, I was young and dumb, and uh, you know, did, didn't even think of returning it or whatever. So it wasn't a really big deal. Um, I really, don't, honestly, don't have too many memories with Black because it kept crashing on us, and we didn't play it that much. But from what I remember, it was a really good-looking game for its time, um, really well ahead of its time because of that one mechanic. Um, I can't even remember if it was a hard game or not because I honestly didn't play it that much. So it's probably not not the greatest Nos Shuffle. Um, to do by myself because I don't have a lot of a lot of stories to tell about it. I'm sure Jake would probably have more, or maybe even Kian would have would have more. Um, but I, I think I'll just end it there because there's really not a, not a lot to say about Black. Um, so yeah, that was episode 34 of the 411 folks. Um, probably going to be back next week with another episode. We are heading into the end of the year. It's the 13th of December right now, so not a lot of shows left. Um, for the end of the year. We are coming up to a, a Game of the Year show and I'm going to try and leave it as close as possible as I can to 31st of December. We'll see if we can even do a show on the 31st of December and make that the Game of the Year show. Um, so it's going to be quite exciting. So exciting times ahead for the 411 folks and uh, hopefully maybe I can do another solo episode or two um, before then. So until next time, I will see you all later.